All right. Well, let's pray and let's get to studying. Gracious and loving God, thank you for this time together. May this time be helpful and fruitful for our faith. May it open our eyes and um, help us cling to your promises more uh, in this time. And certainly uh, it is a challenging, precarious time. And so uh, give us your Holy Spirit in our conversation in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, more, more numbers. <laughs> more, we're not wandering very much longer here. Uh, let's get over here and we'll share that, that screen. I was doing some research on, let's see, cited by, we'll put that over there. I was doing some research on some of the festivals because we're, we're going to be looking at that today. So, but let me get us to chapter 28. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Whoops. Here well, we go. Can't see. Oh, okay. Guess if you want to take that off, we to switch places. There we go. Okay. All right. Um. All right. Oh, why did it go back that far? very strange. It's really weird. Okay. Hmm. I just had it at 28. Well, I did that. All right. I'm not even in the right book. What happened to all my other ESVs here? So interesting. All right. What did I do? I pressed something. All right, this is where we're at. Hopefully everybody can see that. Mm -hmm. yep. So we'll read through uh, um, this little section on daily offerings and we'll see what that has for us and then we move on to the festivals. We might even knock out a couple chapters today. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel and say to them, my offering, my food for my food offerings, my pleasing aroma, you shall be careful to offer to me at its appointed time. And you shall say to them, this is the food offering that you shall offer to the Lord. Two male lambs, a year old, without blemish. Let's see here. Um, without blemish. I lost my spot. There we go. Day by day as a regular offering. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. Also a tenth of an ephah. Um, ephah is about three-fifths of a bushel or 22 liters of fine flour for a grain offering mixed with a quarter of hen of beaten oil. Hen was about four quarts. It is a regular burnt offering which was ordained at Mount Sinai for a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. Its drink offering shall be a quarter of a hen of e for each lamb. In the holy place, you shall pour out a drink offering of strong drink to the Lord. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight, like the grain offering of the morning and like its drink offering, you shall offer it as a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. All right. A lot of good stuff getting burn up. Quick question. Is this per family, per the group, per person? That's a lot of the lambs that are going to be given out. I think this is just for the whole people. I don't think this is per, per family. So this, this would be for all of Israel, I think. Um, and this would be in the tabernacle, I believe. But now the interesting thing, remember where we're at in the story. So this is where the people are getting ready to enter the promised land. Do they have all of this stuff when, the, when this is spoken? Probably not. 
I mean, they don't have all that grain and all the all those good things. This is really, um, this is really anticipating the abundance, I think, of the promised land. All the oil, all the, the grain, the livestock. Um, at, in the holy place you shall pour out a drink offering, a strong drink to the Lord. The other land you shall offer twilight. So this even to me almost anticipates a temple, but it, it seems like this is um, a reiterating of the offering and the structure of the giving um, in the temple. So I think, Bob, I could be wrong, but I think this is not for every family. Um, that would be way too big of a burden for sure. Um, let's see, this is from the Bible Guide. All this important information for priests as they lead the regularly life of the community. These chapters of the Book of Numbers show us the holiness of God and the seriousness of sin. They warn against half-hearted casual worship. They encourage us to come to God for forgiveness and cleansing. Although we have different time, place, and culture, the principle of reverence is still all important. Um, so this is where they're offered every day in the morning. Their special sacrifice is Sabbath and the first day of the month. Regulations are given here for the Passover, and then it goes on to the festivals here. So, so yeah, I think that's a I'm a I'm correcting my response that this is not per family. This is for all of the people. Yep. Pastor, can I share a note from Bible Study Fellowship? Sure, sure. It says that um, each feast had its own special requirements for offerings, and the peak mm. was reached at the Feast of Tabernacles with an even larger number of animals offered. In a year's time, the regular offerings totaled 113 bulls, 32 rams, 1,086 lambs, more than a ton of flour, and a thousand bottles of oil and wine. To these were added the countless offerings of individual worshipers. So this was, you know, of all of them. And it, and it just points out how grateful we can be for Jesus Christ and his final offering. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like, I, that's really helpful just for somebody to go through the trouble of tallying all of these offerings up. That's a lot of stuff, isn't it? And then that Jesus took care of all that is your the point of your last comment, I think. Um, yeah. Um, let's let's think about the concept, and I know I've talked about this before, but it's right here before us now. What do you think about taking all this good stuff and just burning it up? What's your reaction to that well i i think um these sacrifices it did cause the people to give up things um and and it makes us as gloria said appreciate sacrifice but we still uh, as a worshiping community need to support our church and give an offering that is sacrificial uh, I'm not sure how much a thousand rams would cost, but somebody could figure that out in our budget, I'm sure. But I think <laughs> Pastor Bill is worth more than a thousand rams. So, but um, we need to <laughs> we need to know that God is the giver of all things, even that checkbook that we write out the check, uh, and we need to sacrifice a bit. Even though Christ is the ultimate sacrifice, we need to give in thanksgiving for that sacrifice and give so we do feel it's a sacrifice, not just the extra quarter and the dollar that we happen to have. That's done. Nice, thank you, Ethel May. So yeah, that's a great comment that we have a need to give in a sacrificial kind of way, you know, for it, you know, um, yeah, no, that's really helpful. And I appreciate that I'm worth more than however many, <laughs> however many, rams or whatever yeah. yeah i think when you see something burned up <clears throat> it's like you know for me i'd be thinking wow look how many kids you could feed with that or how many <clears throat> how long it took me to grow that lamb or whatever you know and i'm not sure we always so with money we, i was kind of going the same place ethel may was it 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 hurts a little bit to 
give if you're, you know, especially if you're tithing, you know, that's can be a lot of money. And um, it's easy to think, well, you know, I could, um, we could put this toward vacation, or we could put this toward private school, or, you know, whatever. So I think it helps us to be mindful of what we could be doing with it versus what we are doing with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Good. Excellent. Very helpful applications here of this little section as we get going. Other thoughts on this little section on offerings? I want to see if I can get a, see you all at once over here. Um, you know, I, I know, like, again, I, I want to be a broken record, but I've said this quite a few times. Um, and I'll attribute Mark Allen Powell with this, um, but in his book on giving to God, um, he, uh, he makes the point that in the Old Testament, people would just give stuff and burn it up. Now, there was a sense that that was the way God could receive it, you know, as a, a, this aroma, that this is the way it, you know, because God is spirit and, you know, <laughs> you, God isn't there to just hand it over to him, that this was a way to kind of hand over that to God. But, but yeah, in this case, you know, like Kim, I appreciate what you said, you know, I mean, the people might say, well, why can't we just give that to the poor? Let's do something good with all of that. Or, you know, hopefully they would think that way. But, but there is a value in just the act of giving or returning probably better than giving returning to God, that which is of value to us. Um, yes, now we put our offerings to work to do good things for the ministry of the church and for other people, and, um, and that's good. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but there is value and help in giving regardless of what is done with what you give. Does that make sense? It's just the act itself is important. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. and, and um, I've been listening to that um, uh, Outlaw God podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, the most recent one that I listened to talked about um, um, ritual and finding <clears throat> like returning to God. So the pattern of pattern of God in the Old Testament is he promises, then the promise gets hidden or obscured somehow, and then he, you know, puts the promise up again. Yeah. And um, he, uh, um, Stephen Paulson said that, you know, that's where Luther really kind of loved that and, and found that found comfort in that in um, things like the catechism and returning to it daily and teaching it daily and in working your baptism and you know we have this liturgy that we work every Sunday that's comfortable and and we find God there and so I think there's there's something to these um, sacrifices they're doing them you know they're doing them weekly or yeah. they're doing them it, when they sin or whatever, it, it's it's just ritual. It's something that you can do that you know God will be there. Right, right. It's something that keeps working on us mm -hmm. from the outside again, you know. And yeah, yeah. No, that's great, Kim. That's a great connection there with what he's, Dr. Paulson's been saying in that podcast, which, yes, I highly recommend that. It's podcast. so good. It's really yeah, good. It's really, really good stuff. Um, I always considered it a part of the liturgy, and I miss that now. So I may only check in, you know, but I miss that part of the liturgy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's in one sense, it's the mo the the greatest, the most. Uh, Mark Allen Powell says that's his favorite part of the service where he gets to give, you know, um, and uh, yeah. No, and we have to be creative with that now, and, you know, <laughs> um, uh, fortunately, people are doing that, um, so, um, yeah, yeah, I like the, the insert of the liturgy and the ritual, and 
I think that human beings, we are tangible, physical people. I think those, um, yeah, there are always dangers to rituals that they can just be, lose their importance, but they also, um, as we invest in them, they work on us, like you're saying, Kim, they, they have an effect on us. The, the liturgy, it, you know, so many people look at the liturgy and they say, oh, it's just people rotely going through stuff that don't, you know, and that's, it's so sad because I'm sure that's true for some people, but if, if you work at it correctly, it works on you. Yeah, a little bit like water on rock because, you know, it takes a long time, but it does keep shaping us and working us and directing us and ordering our lives. And we're going to get into some, you know, the festivals and the feasts and, and we as human beings, I think we need these things. Um, they can be helpful. So, yeah, yeah. All right, excellent. Don't you think too, in this case, where we're at in numbers, you know, it's, it's new leadership going in. And so they're, they're going over God's commands here again to renew the fact that God, they, the leaderships may be changed, but God hasn't changed. He's still looking for the same kind of response from his people. And, and I, um, I like the fact that um, they did renew this, you know, they were reteaching this to the new leadership. And, and I love the fact that you offer your foundations class periodically. And mm. it's a, it's a repeat because I know we've taken it twice and I learned something, both, you know, both times. And it, it's important that we are reminded over and yeah. over again of what, what God expects. Yeah, absolutely. And, and re reminded of what God expects, what God has done for us, what, you know, it's not a once and done thing. And that if faith comes to us from hearing, but, and by hearing of the word of God, you know, if then we need to keep hearing it to keep having faith. Um, the number one, well, not the, I don't know, that's, I, I'm prone to overstating things, but um, a big factor that I hear from people who do what Hebrews says you shouldn't do is neglect to come together and worship in some fashion um, and hear the word. The, you know, what people don't get is that, because then they start going, well, I don't really feel a need to go anymore. Well, you don't feel a need to go because you're not going. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's, it's just like, you know, um, uh, again, this is a story I've probably told a lot of times, but Tom Rogers, a homiletics pro prophet, before he became a prof, kind of helped me out in Lodi for a while in my parish there. And, um, you know, he tells the story about people who are starving to death and people who are, one, I, I've never had this experience, that if you go without food long enough, you're not hungry anymore. Mm your body, you know, you know, like it gets supper time. I'm, I'm like, okay, let's, what are we going to have to eat? But if you go without food for four or five, six, seven days, your body stops telling you, you need to eat. Um, well, it's the same way spiritually. Um, you know, you stop getting, receiving the word and you kind of lose that hunger for it. Um, and so, yeah, um, this is a, this is a, a thing. And um, the more you stay away, the less it's not, well, for some people they miss it more, but actually the opposite happens. The more you stay away, the less you miss it. You know? mm -hmm. And you can be starving to death spiritually, but not know it. Yeah. I, I hope that doesn't sound too judgmental. I mean it in the most loving sense. So, yep. Yeah. Oh, good. Good yeah. work. Yeah, that please. Back in the Midwest, when we were there many, many years ago, there was a really kind of a fun TV show called Who Do You Trust? And that is, that's my big uh, thing. I, I'm not always trusting God. It's easy for me to turn to look at the checkbook and look at the corporations. Well, are they going to be hiring or are they going to keep their people or what are they going to do? And I tend to be a worrywart. And... Um, 
Mm-hmm. It's, been, <laughs> it's been a lifelong, it's a lifelong thing with me. And I like what Ethel May said about the sacrificial part, because I, it really strikes me that if we don't give up, we're still trusting the government, we're trusting the, the welfare, we're trusting somebody to come and, and help me out. And it's a somebody versus God. And, and he wants us to know that we have, we have abilities and we have the ability to, to trust him. But it's, it kind of feeds your, your own self and helps you grow to, in confidence to know that you can trust God. Nice. I, I, the part that really rings with what you said there for me is that in giving, like here in this text, it re- keeps the stuff, the food, the grain from being our God. Right. And, and, and it keeps, it resets where we put our trust. Yeah. And beautiful, beautiful. I just, Bruce I just Smith. got back from doing a big batch of shopping. Yes. Which I do periodically. And I have to stop myself from saying, well, now I better get another one of those mm-hmm. in case we run out. Then that's, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good example. I could come home with twice the load. And I know I overload many times. Yeah, sure. And then I think, okay, I've got too much here. Now I've got to take it down to the food bank or how to get it, how to get it out of here. Yeah. And so then all my attention gets into stuff and needs. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great, Sharon. Thank you. I think Bruce Smith was jumping in there. Well, I'm, I'm going to state the obvious. I think we've touched on it, but I don't know if we've touched on it enough. So I'm going to... I'm, I always like to relate the Old Testament to the New Testament. And what I'm saying is, is that not, not only our giving as far as our offering, what we're doing, and the reason I'm still a Lutheran, is that we're doing the Eucharist, and, and, and it means something. I mean, it's not just a little memorial thing that we have to get through once a month. We do it every week, and what we're doing is celebrating and partaking of the sacrifice of Jesus, his body and blood. So he's he has become the lamb, and he has become the sacrifice. It it the the Old Testament uh, rituals have have not been thrown out. They've been fulfilled and and done perfectly with Christ and His sacrifice. And so, like I said, it's just it, it's it's very important to remember what we're doing when we're when we're partaking of the Eucharist. Yeah. It's, uh, um, Kim, this will remind you of what Dr. Polson was talking about. It's the, what did he say? The reapplying of the promise, or there was a separate word he used. Uh, reposting. Reposting, there you go. Um, you know, that God reposts the promise. Yeah, Bruce, absolutely. And in the Eucharist, God reposts the promise. He, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for you. We, and we need that, you know, weekly or more often than that, or what, you know, that we need that reposting to come upon us. And some, it isn't just a memorial. It is something is happening. Yeah. yeah you know, love absolutely. it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it's okay to study the Old Testament if you understand that you're, you're, you're finding the, the basis for our Christian faith. You know what I mean? What they call the Judeo-Christian faith. Um, you know, is, is that this is our basis, and this is why we needed Jesus to fulfill these partial offerings that these guys made back then. They didn't, they couldn't do any better than that. So God honors that, but God brought us the perfect sacrifice. Yeah. No, it's you know some people have tried to make sense of Jesus without the Old Testament, but it's a impossible task you know so yeah or the hebrew scriptures yep all right good excellent other thoughts on this first part of this you know pleasing aroma um you know i yeah this it's just a it's a the hebrew notion of god is is so cool this is not a God who is 
an immovable mover, uh, a distant removed, you know, cold, <laughs> you know, uh, ambiguous figure. This is a God who loves, who cares, who rejoices, a pleasing aroma to the Lord, you know. Um, I know it may seem archaic, but it actually is actually quite cool that that God can be pleased. Um, uh, when we pray, God is pleased. When we love, God is pleased. When we love our neighbor, God is pleased. When we work to, to you know, bring healing and hope to folks, God is pleased. You know, um, when we offer, you know, what God has first given us, um, it's it's a pleasing thing to God. I think that's a that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, In Revelation, doesn't it say that our prayers are a pleasing aroma? Yeah, they write up like incense and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And Marty Haugen's put that in the Holden Evening Prayer, you know. Right. Let my prayers rise up like, like incense, incense before you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's great. All right. Um, the last thing I will say, just to reiterate before we move on. You know, we can talk about giving to God, and semantics are semantics. You know, we can parse over words. But in truth, if God has given us everything, we're not really giving God anything. You know, we're returning to God what God's given us. But, you know, we can talk about giving to God. But as long as we keep that, you know, in mind, that really we're returning stuff to God that God's given us. So, yeah. And like Sharon, you said, this giving keeps you know return when we return our stuff to god it keeps that in mind where did this stuff come from <laughs> who do we trust all right let's move on on the sabbath day two male lambs a year old without a blemish and two tenths of an ephah of fine flour for a grain offering mixed with oil and drink offering this is the burnt offering of every sabbath besides the regular burnt offering and its drink offering so so some more on the Sabbath day, um, a special amount on the Sabbath, the day of rest. Uh, don't forget that, you know, when we think about the Sabbath, Martin Luther's small catechism, Kathy's probably got it out there. Um, but when we, re to remember the Sabbath day for us, in addition to making an offering or worship and all of that is, about um, not neglecting the word, but gladly hearing the word, the preaching of the word. Uh, that's what Sabbath is for us. It's giving the word time to work in our lives. And that, that's what the Sabbath is. Uh, all There's right. Something else that occurred to me with uh, the, the Old Testament giving, we're to bring all of these things and take them and, and present them. And there's a lot, I mean, there's tremendous amount here. And mm -hmm. in the New Testament, we are now free to take those things and pass them on and have them available to help other people in need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't, we don't now, you know, burn things up. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> You know, uh, we don't put the money and, you know, set it on fire and as a pleasing aroma. We, we do good things with it. And that's a great thing. Um, and the church right from the very beginning was taking care of widows and orphans. The apostles were having to spend so much time with that that they created a whole other order in the church called deacons. who were waiters of tables. That's what that word means. And deacons became the ones who oversaw the administration of the, the support for the widows and the orphans and the poor and and what so the apostles could attend themselves to the preaching. Uh, so um, yeah, now our offerings get to support the the gospel and those in need. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Any other thoughts on that little part on the Sabbath? A little extra measure there. All right. At the beginnings of your months, you shall offer a burnt offering to the Lord, two bulls from the herd, one ram. Um, 
seven male lambs, a year old without blemish, also three tenths of an ephah. So we got some more, you know, contents here. Their drink offering shall be half of a hen of wine um, for a bull and a third of hen for a ram and a quarter of a hen for a lamb. I bet you that smelled good. Um, this was the burnt offering for each month throughout the months of the year. Also one male goat as a, for a sin offering to the Lord. It shall be offered besides the regular burnt offering and its drink offering. So, so you know, we can get down into the, we, the, the real details of some of this, but uh, I think it's cool to see that these sacrifices and these offerings kind of ordered the people's life. You know, you've got the Sabbath, you've got every day you have these orders. And yes, we don't do these same offerings anymore. We don't need to, but yet um, there are a lot of Christian communities that have morning and afternoon and evening prayer. You know, these are daily orders. Uh, you know, monasteries practice these orders and they have these patterns and 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 that it can be really helpful. So shall we Pastor, keep going? I Please. Pastor, I have a question. Seventh day Adventists, you know, they they try to keep the Old Testament thing going. How much of this stuff do they get into? That's a great question. I don't know that uh, to, uh, in detail. I know that the Seventh day Adventists in general feel like the Levitical code around dietary and laws still applies. They, of course, worship on this, what they call the seventh day, which is Saturday because that is the Jewish Sabbath. Um, so, um, you know, that's kind of a hallmark of their church. I know the other hallmark of their church is very much uh, uh, the, the imminent coming of Christ, that Jesus is returning, you know, any moment. And so they're very focused on a certain kind of eschatology. But they also, you know, really feel very... They, they still feel like the law of these, you know, the food laws and whatnot are still binding on the Christian. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I guess I'll have to Google yeah. it or maybe even get a book. But I, yeah. I don't know how many of uh, you people drive down to uh, Portland or have driven down there. But on the way, if I've got my sense of direction right, there's this big brick building with a you know, a pond in front of it and everything, and it says Seventh Day Adventist. I think it's some sort of regional headquarters, but it, I mean that—that's a million-dollar building that's sitting there on the highway. You know, it's so they've—they've they've got some—they got some things going on, I guess. They have a lot of schools. They um, are all throughout our country and the world. Um, I forget the name of the person who was, really was the kind of founding person. But, uh, you know, if, if the average ELCA Lutheran gave 10%, like the average Seventh-day Adventist person gives because they have to, because it's, the law is binding, uh, you know, we could do a lot more than we are currently. Our, the ELCA average for a member in the pew is 1%. Ooh. Um, the, but again, you know, that's the cost of making the gospel free, perhaps. But here's the thing, Bruce, they wouldn't be doing these things. These things are particularly focused on the, the, the tabernacle and the temple, and there is no more temple or tabernacle. So Seventh-day Adventists would go more to the Levitical moral food dietary laws that type of thing. And then they see, they feel very stringent about Saturday being the day of worship. Um, and, and maybe, and you know, I'm glad you brought that up because, um, you know, Christians early on did worship on the Jewish Sabbath because that's what they knew and that made sense to them. Somewhere in the second century, we see that Christians started worshiping um, on Sundays that might go back even further than that, but we, we have external biblical evidence that in, in the second century, they start to worship on Sunday. And it actually was quite a controversy in the church as far as, you know, Saturday, Sunday, this type of thing. Well, the, I the, always use, you know, this is part of the I'm, I'm not trying to put it on everybody else, but 
I've always seen the, the relationship, my relationship with Christ. This this was way back when I was in college. It kind of came over me that the, it boils down to having a vital relationship with Christ. It's what it all boils down to. And so, I mean, the Seventh Day Adventist thing and this Mormon thing and all these things where they get off into the laws and the little laws. You know, if it doesn't distract from your vital relationship with Christ and knowing that that's that's what matters is your relationship with Christ and through the help of the Holy Spirit and the Bible and in and, and our, and our ordinances and, and all that kind of stuff, I mean, you know, then I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. That's, you know, that's for God to worry about, not me. You know what I mean? Well, I, I'm all for not judging other people. <laughs> but yeah, and that's the question. When you insert the law as a requirement, does it take away from your relationship and your vital? Is an interesting question. Adventists and Mormons very different. Uh, Mormons don't believe in the Trinity. I'm pretty sure Adventists do, but I don't know that for sure. So um yeah, yeah I, Bruce I, uh the not not Bruce sorry Bert was trying to jump in there a minute ago just looking at all the details that are required by the priests in those days the details of all this stuff how would they know that the lambs are seven are you know one year old and without blemish and it goes on and on and on with all these details you wonder can they really do it yeah <laughs> What if they miss? What if the, one of the lambs is a two years old? Yeah, I mean, it's, just, it's it's quite a quite a chore for them, for the priests. Yeah, I think the issue here is that you're giving the best of what you have. You're not giving God seconds or thirds. You're giving Him the best, and yeah. if the best happens to be a slight blemish on the land, You're still giving the best that you have. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what they're trying to get at. If you set the bar high, you know. If you set the bar low, you're gonna meet a law. If you set the bar high, then you have what you strive for. Yeah. We know that. We know that's the meaning, just like Christ said that in a way, the meaning is to love God. Uh, but here in this, what we're reading here is very, very specific. This uh, this gave the priests and the these folks a lot to keep track of, didn't it? Yeah. And a lot to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm absolutely yeah a lot to do so um and then within judaism too there are those that say well let's get at the spirit of this and and so they get at the spirit of it. and then there you got the ultra orthodox folks who are like no we're going to do every you know, little thing although yep. again this even the ultra orthodox wouldn't be focused on these because these but are, they, it's just unimaginable that's yeah. the bill yes I've been reading this whole thing. I'm thinking two things. God provided for them when they were in the wilderness with manna every day. Didn't have anything left over, but he provided every day. Then I think back about the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, which he has provided again. So when he asked them to be sacrifices, he will provide those sacrifices to give. Yes. Back. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. God gives and, you know, God wouldn't ask of it if he wasn't going to give it for us to, you know, return. Yeah. Yeah. And, and God did in the promised land. This people are going to have this kind of abundance. So. Is it pleasing a woman to the Lord? Yeah. 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 Are they still eating manna at this point? Wouldn't that just. I, yeah. Good question. Um, I don't, I don't know that um whether they're still eating manna at this point yeah what are they eating at this stage <laughs> that'd be a fun thing for someone to figure out just going by numbers the book of numbers i don't know as we've been reading through up to this point has the manna stopped let's see when does it say the manna stopped i know somewhere it says the manna stopped so let's do a quick quick search here on this Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it says that they kept eating it for 40 years and then it stopped once they settled in the land. So you're right, they'd still be eating manna. Yeah. Um, so they don't, these things are a promise. It, right, exactly. Yes. 
Yeah. I, I don't yeah. want to Yeah, me. right here. Yeah, they ate manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. In Exodus, it says, people of Israel ate manna for 40 years till they came to the habitable land. They ate manna till it came to the border. So, so they're still at the border. They're not there yet. Till they came to a habitable. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Excellent. Let's see here. Oh, now we got to go back. From from your knowledge of history, Pastor, it was was the the books of Moses, and I assume Numbers is a book of Moses. Um, were these oral traditions until they ended up in the uh, Babylonian captivity, where they started writing all this stuff down? Is that how that goes? <laughs> that is a kind of a seminary question, huh? Yeah, it is, but it's a fun question to ponder. Mo I would say that most critical scholars feel that most of the written scripture happens in the Babylonian exile. I think that's an oversimplification, I, and I think we can clearly see from the historical books, uh, like, you know, references to things being written down. Um, and the law was written down. Like Josiah, one of the kings, uh, they discover the book of the law in the temple. They had lost their Bible, you know, <laughs> and so that, that prompts all these reforms. So, so there's definitely written scripture before the Babylonian exile. Um, now, I think that the traditional view that Moses wrote, kind of sat down and wrote, wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, is is an oversimplification too. I think it did have different streams and strands and additions and, and whatnot. And I think there is a priestly writer, I would say, or an editor of the Pentateuch of the first five books of the Bible that-, that you know, Yeah, that's what I'm getting at right there. Yeah, is pr particularly concerned with the issue of the exile, but um, uh, definitely, you know, as far as all the details, you know, that's it makes sense that that comes from some a more priestly source that's what i was thinking the way this is so like bert was talking about all the details and everything i'm thinking that these details got you know written down on black and white at the captivity yeah 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 and maybe with the mind that hey we got to make sure and do this right so we don't end up yeah. messed up again. absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that brings up an interesting point about the purpose of the sacrifices, too, because the Babylonian gods, you made a sacrifice that would rain, or you made a sacrifice so that you, um, for fertility, or for whatever the god was that you were sacrificing to, but Yahweh is asking for these sacrifices for love, for honor. Yeah. Um, not for anything kind of capricious or um it's just because he said so yep that's a great point that's a great point very different kind of motive um you know and reason for giving yep yep the bad thing about me teaching this study from from the church oh maybe People drop things off, and I'm the only one here sometimes. So, like, I got to go out and help people get in. But anyway, yeah, no, that's a great point, Kim. Very helpful. Yeah. All right, good. Well, let's get into the Passover. On the 14th day of the first month is the Lord's Passover. So this is the 14th day, the lunar, you know, they're watching the moon. And on the 15th day of this month is a feast. Seven days shall, of, shall unleavened bread be eaten. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any work, but offer a food offering, a burnt offering to the Lord. Two bulls from the herd, one ram, and seven male lambs a year old. See that they are without blemish. Also, there, 
their grain offering of fine flour mixed with oil, three tenths of an ephah shall you offer for a bull and two tenths for the ram. I'm thinking, did we already read this? But no, this is for the Passover. Also one male goat um, for a sin offering to make atonement for you. So here a goat as distinguished from a lamb as a sin offering. Um, you shall offer these besides the burnt offering of the morning which is for a regular burnt offering. In the same way, you shall offer daily for seven days the food of a food offering, which with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. It shall be offered besides the regular burnt offering and its drink offering. And on the seventh day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. So here's the great reference to the great Passover, probably the festival. Um, still to this day would be, you know, the festival of Passover. A lot of critical scholars uh, here want to say um, that nowhere in the Hebrew scriptures is a lamb ever offered for an atonement. It was for the Passover, so the angel of death would pass over. But as far as atonement or this uh, sense of um, you know, but it says in verse 22, it's a sin offering. Yes, but it's not a lamb, it's a goat. Oh, I see. So that's where some scholars want to say, where did we get this lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world thing from John? And I I think it's it's parsing things a little too far down, but just like Jesus took a passage from two different Old Testament books, <laughs> And like love, you know, we think love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, your neighbor as yourself is one, a quote from one passage in the Old Testament. No, it's a quote from two different. There's one passage that says love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then there's another one that says love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus puts them together. So I think what we see in John and Jesus speaking in the Gospel of John is, you know, um, uh, you know, bringing this sense of the lamb who defeated death, and then also the sense of atonement, where the blood is shed for atonement, um, the the pat, you know, the wiping out of sin. Um, you you see those brought together. So a lot of like I've had some biblical New Testament scholars say I have no idea what the Lamb of God means um, in the New Testament. I go, really? You, are you? <laughs> Uh, you know, I that it just it, I kind of scratch my head with that, but but it is true. I guess if, can't see the forest for the trees. A little bit like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, it's you, you, we've got the we get the concept here. So um, yeah, and Jesus was a sacrifice like none other. So you know, it, it makes sense that he's a lamb. You know. So anyway. That's just a little bit of some background, but a goat for a sin offering. Yeah, so that's a part of the Passover, as well as the uh, the other lambs who were, you know, sacrificed, you know, to celebrate the Pas Pascha, the Pascha, the passing over the angel of death. And obviously the New Testament really, you know, hooks into the celebration of the Passover in some very, you know, deep and abiding ways. Uh, just to name a few, uh, the Gospel of John has Jesus being crucified at the same time that the Passover lambs were being sacrificed. Um, the Synoptic Gospels have Jesus celebrating the Passover meal when he institutes the Lord's Supper. Um, you know, uh, you know, the, part of the Passover was a celebration of the Exodus, right? When the people were set free from bondage in Egypt. Uh, the, the significance of the gospel is often cast in the New Testament as a kind of setting free, as a liberating in the sense of the forgiveness of sins and, and not being... Uh, alienated from God anymore, but now we're at peace with God. And so there's amazing connections to this Passover event. And I love the one in Luke, because in Luke, in the Transfiguration, um, 
Luke is the only one that tells us what Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were talking about. Uh, Matthew and Mark tell us that, you know, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah appeared with Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration, but Luke tells us they were talking about Jesus is what? His exodus. His, his, that's exactly the word. So there's a connection to the Passover again. So that, so that the life, death, and resurrection, and particularly the death and resurrection of Jesus is a, is a Passover, a new creation event. Very good. Very good. Yep. Yep. See, you know, I love when we get into Jesus. I said this too. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. Um, and Bert? What is a holy convocation? All right, let's take a look at that. Assembly, convocation is a, an assembly. Yeah. Um, summons, assembly. So a holy is going to be the word for kadosh in Hebrew. So it's the weight, it's the, a weighty convocation. So it's not just a get together, but a sanctified holy conv convocation. Um, so you have this special get together. Um, that is not just like any other get together. So convocation is the, the word for an assembly or summons. Um, yeah. Um, and no ordinary work. And of course, that's a little ambiguous. <laughs> but that's another thing that, that, you know, putting down our work is, uh, we could spend, you know, lots of time on that, couldn't we? Well, I think Jesus explained it. He said, "If your if your cows need to get get water, you you don't not be, give them their water on on the set the Sabbath." Yeah, that's just what he says. You, just, yep. you don't do ordinary work, but you have to take care of your cattle. I'm, yeah. I'm just talking to the farm boy here. I know, but you know, I've talked to some very devout farmers who didn't do anything but the absolute essential, even to the point of not harvesting when a hailstorm is headed down their way because it was a Sunday, you know, and I'm like, get out there and get your weed in. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Worship on Monday, you know, whatever. But that's how seriously they took it. And now we totally blow this off completely. We never rest, you know. No, we uh, have to go to the kids' soccer game. Yeah, that's right. Yep. No, there is no holy moment for our society, you know. And uh, I know we have we're in a pluralistic, multi-religion society now, and maybe we should all get together and say, well, we're we're all going to have one time <laughs> during the week where nothing else happens. But that that probably won't happen. All right, good. So that's the feast of uh, Passover, something that was a big part of the life of the people. Well, we get a nice review of all the, the feasts. So on the day of the first fruits, when you offer a grain offering of the new grain to the Lord at your feast of weeks, you shall have a holy convocation. So another holy assembly. You shall not do any work. It's interesting that holy assemblies go along with not doing work or ordinary work. Yeah, so that's important. You can do the holy work but not the ordinary work or the everyday but offer up go ahead uh, catholics have their new pope when they go for a new pope they have a convent convocation and that's all they do is work on the pope nothing else that happens during that time yep they work on yep. the what work on the election of a pope of the pope that they don't they, they sit they do that they talk they they do eat <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good. Was there somebody else jumping in there? there okay. Are three three uh, references when John uh, baptizes Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of the God of God who takes away the sin of the world. And they're interesting. Isaiah 53 17, if I can find it here. Get back to it. Uh, what was that? 53 7. Um, we all like sheep. Well, no, that's not it. Hold on a second. I'll get it. Yes, he was oppressed and afflicted, 
yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. In Genesis, it's uh, 22.8, and this is where Abraham took the wood and put, uh, put it on the offering and placed Isaac on it. And as the two of them went on up together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, uh, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And back in Genesis, uh, oh no, I mean, uh, Jeremiah, it's the third one, 11, 19, says, uh, where are we here, 19, 19. I had been like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not realize they had plotted against me, saying, let us destroy the tree and its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. But, O oh Lord Almighty, you who judge righteously. So those three are, are referring to the lamb being led to the slaughter. And that's God's purpose. Right. And, and again, I'm not... I'm not like trying to press this because I don't really agree with their point, but those are not sin offerings. You know, no. the lamb is giving ah. itself up, but it's not like That's, for atonement. Yes, no, it, it's definitely the lamb, give, you know, be, you know, for as an offering is there, you know, in lots of places, but as a specific sin offering, that's what scholars want to say. Hmm, that's interesting. Old Testament. There were goats and other things that were sin offerings, but lambs were never a sin offering. But would, it be, would it be anything to do with being totally innocent and free of any, any wrongdoing? Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that the Old Testament, it, clearly the blood was shed, you know, mm -hmm. for as a sin offering. And so I don't know why we get wrapped up with the fact that now it's a lamb and Jesus isn't the goat who takes away the sin of the world. Well, of course he's not the goat because he's also the lamb. He's the Passover lamb, but that lamb also, his blood takes away the sin of the world. So yeah, and, and you look at Isaiah 53, that was a great passage, um, um, you know, led to the slaughter like a sheep before the shears. So, you know, so you totally see see that and then the new testament says well this lamb who was led the slaughter was actually you know um, atoning for the sin of the world so yeah yeah but no so so it's there a lot in the old testament and there's some great connections but when people parse it down they they want to say well technically lambs were not offered as sin offerings but whatever <laughs> it's it's totally there. I think it's a beautiful bringing together of a symbol um, that you know even goes beyond what the Hebrew scriptures were talking about. So yeah, no, that's excellent. So this this um, offering of the feast of weeks. This is Pentecost. This is the this is the feast when the Holy Spirit came, um, and this is the the feast of the harvest. And it was also later became associated with the giving of the law because Moses gave the law um, right about this time. And so as the celebration went on throughout history, it became, you know, a co connected to that. So if you want to look up more background on this, you would think, look at Pentecost, Fe Feast of Weeks. Um, so again, you've got all these offerings to mark these special moments and these special times. Anything on the Feast of Weeks? Hmm. I, I always thought that all of these things were all these offerings, uh, including the lambs and everything. I thought that was all you know, under the umbrella of sin offerings, but I, what were they made for then? If they weren't sin offerings, they they might have they were just as dedication as thanks as you know thank offering. There are all kinds of offerings. 
there's thank offerings, sin offerings, you know, first fruits, uh, you know, um, the lamb offering was the blood that caused the angel of death to pass over. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's the one that I think is the most telling that how is it that the angel of death passes over us? Well, it's what for us now that it's what that blood did, that atoning sacrifice for our sin. So it makes yeah, perfect sense. I'm, I'm going to yeah. stick my, with my old way of looking at it. It doesn't, this, this other business doesn't make much sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get the point, and I always want you to know these points so you're well educated. <laughs> well, and so again, we've got another male goat for the atonement. Um, and, and if Christ is the offering that takes care of all offerings, well, of course, he takes care of that one too so good um that's the big picture yeah that's the big picture uh, rather than going into 29 because we're almost at the end of our time because we've got the offering of the day of atonement here which we can't wait to get to and then the feast of booze which is a really great interesting feast so that's the cool thing about this little section of numbers as we get these reviews of the great festivals. I know Bob, um, you know, asked at one point, hey, could we just do a Bible study on these Old Testament festivals? And, and, and so that, you know, th this, this kind of helps us do that. Um, I know I had over here, let's see, I think I pulled up Baker Encyclopedia. Yeah, so these are, uh, you probably can't see that. Let me make it bigger. Uh, and let's get rid of the table of contents. So these are some of the, you know, um, this is Passover, Pentecost. This is the Feast of Bo Weeks. This is the Harvest Festival, First Fruits, giving of the First Fruits of the Harvest. Um, and then this is the one that they're going to go into next, trumpets, and then the Day of Atonement's coming up. And you can see the biblical references for each one over here. Um, tabernacles is one that I'm particularly interested in, too, because the Gospel of John does a lot with that one. Um, but these are the other um, feasts. Um, I'm trying to see if they say something uh, really, probably what would be better to do is in our little bit of time that we have left is for me to go over here and put in Pentecost in this. So in Exodus 23, 16, it's called the Feast of Harvest. Of the first fruits of your labor. Um, these phrases indicate the Feast of Weeks was originally an agricultural festival, an occasion on which the community was expected to show gratitude to God for the first fruits. That first fruits thing is, uh, you know, we always try and get at the spirit of things. So this is a feast about the first fruits. Well, that's what we talk a lot about when it comes to giving, that you don't give to God from what's left over. God gets some of the, you know, the first fruits. So don't wait to give financially to the church and to other things by what you have left over at the end of the month. We know how much is left for that. Um, let's see, the dating of this festival also suggests its original agricultural context. Deuteronomy 6 and 9 says that it is to be dated seven weeks from the time you first put the sickle to the standing grain. Um, we got a direction um, from Leviticus. According to Old Testament, one who is not allowed to work on the day of Pentecost, the sacrifice of various animals and bread. So this is our numbers passage here. Um, in the Hellenistic period, so think 300 BC to 300 AD, and Jesus, of course, sits right in the middle of the Hellenistic period. Pentecost began to lose its association with agriculture and, became, and came increasingly to be associated with the religious history of the Hebrew people. The Book of Jubilees, Continuing to refer to it as first fruits identifies it with the covenant between God and Noah, 
If it was probably after the destruction of the temple in AD 70 that Pentecost was finally transformed into an observation of the giving of Torah on Mount Sinai. Exodus 9.1 was interpreted to mean that the interval between Passover and the arrival at Sinai was 50 days. So you, you have the Exodus event of Sinai, and then 50 days later, Moses gives the law. Well, so there's where you get Pentecost. Thus, in Judaism, Shavuot continues to be an observance of Thanksgiving for Torah. I think it's, it's kind of a cool little twist or that, that the Feast of Pentecost now for us as Christians is the celebration of the giving of the Spirit. And for Jewish folks, it was the celebration of the giving of the law. Um, the, the New Testament shows clearly that Pentecost was celebrated in the first century and that it came to have special Christian significance. Paul says that he plans to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. So, so they're, they're celebrating Pentecost. They continue to celebrate this festival. Apparently, ex he expects his readers to understand his meaning, a fact that has led some interpreters to suggest that Pentecost had become a Christian observance as early as Paul's time. A lot of times, historians think that these festivals arose in a Christian sense much later. Well, this one might have been already going on in Paul's lifetime. Paul does not make another explicit reference to Pentecost, but in Romans eleven sixteen, he appears to have the observance in mind when he speaks of offering a lump of dough as first fruits. And then this talks about the, the event of Pentecost in Acts. But um, yeah, I thought that would be helpful to just read as background for, you know, what happens with this, um, you know, with this, um, the celebration of the offering of the Feast of Weeks as the people are getting ready to enter the promised land. All right, so we'll pick up with the Feast of Trumpets next week and, um, and then the Day of Atonement. I am just giving you a heads up. I am planning on being on vacation. The little, it's kind of the last week of July and the first few days of August in there. It's after the 26th, Sunday the 26th. So that week we will probably not have Bible study. So I'm just giving you a heads up. But then we'll get right back at it in the first part of August. And we'll just keep rolling. Okay. All right. Well, let me close us in a prayer. Um, and... Stop the share here. We'll get everybody back on the screen. And uh, thank you for this study. Thanks for being here. This was cool. I'm getting an education with you on all this good stuff. All right, let's close in prayer. Gracious God, thank you for your word and for and feasts and festivals. And give us your spirit as our great festival of Sunday and celebrating Easter every Sunday. The, the resurrection is still going on, but in a different fashion today. And so as we are not able to gather together in this time, we do pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit and keep us in your word. And we give thanks that the word keeps working on us. May we never um, fall prey to neglecting um, the word and its work in our lives. God, we pray for wisdom for our school administrators and teachers and, and superintendents and school boards. Give them wisdom. Um, we pray for Kim's folks' um, guidance. We pray for um, um, Barb, um, and we pray for her with um, her health, and we pray for Barb Paul as well um, for healing and for her health. So Barb Manbeck and Barb Paul, and for Rob, um, we pray for strength and healing um, and comfort. Um, continue to be with your church and uh, continue to to keep us connected um, until we meet again. Uh, give us understanding for each other, peace and patience. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. You are welcome.